what does it mean to recognize this bedrock peacefulness? It means to experience it. Just like we experience tasting coffee, tasting food, tasting ice cream, tasting whatever, or how we experience hearing music, how we experience touching of our companions, we experience in the same way with our body. With our body we recognize this basic peacefulness. And we feel that basic peacefulness with the whole body and in the whole body. If you feel restless, nervous, anxious, for whatever reason, see if that anxiousness, nervousness, restlessness, how does it um, relate to with that peacefulness? Try to let go and relax of that nervousness as much as you can. Restlessness and nervousness is, is because the subconscious mind, um, you know, it subconscious mind causes it. And it sticks to the body. That's why, you know, people who are nervous, anxious, they need to move. They twitch. They can't sit still. But now, see if you can let go of that nervousness, restlessness and let it dissolve in that basic peacefulness. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily... If you feel restlessness, it doesn't necessarily just disappear all of a sudden. We need to remember that as human beings, our bodies and minds are organic. They are not, we are not machines. So that's why it takes time to, if you are restless, it takes time for that restlessness to dissolve. But nevertheless, you know, Follow the instructions in the best of your ability. If some of that restlessness, nervousness, uh, dissolves into that basic peacefulness, that is already a good experience. So don't try too much. There's no need to, um, actually no need either to congratulate us if we get it, get the experience or, or uh, how, does, how should I say, whip us if we fail to experience it. So don't add that extra pressure on yourself. basic peacefulness. We are recognizing ourselves as Buddhas through this one facet of it, one aspect of Buddha nature, which is peacefulness. In other words, um, 
I often speak of the three basic characteristics of Buddha nature. And the third one of those is groundedness. Unshakeability. Cannot be pushed over. Peacefulness is that. It's a different way to express that groundedness. So we all have a Buddha nature that is completely without any confusion regarding our existence, regarding our identity, completely without confusion regarding our identity. What does that mean? It means that the small self, I-ness, me-ness, mine-ness, is not there. It's absent. And that's why it's a relief, recognizing it. So what we are doing here is a very different take on um, meditation or spiritual practice than what you see in many places where you are told to sit in a certain kind of posture for long times perhaps even if you feel physical pain or discomfort. Or there are some other types of uh, strict rules about meditation practice or lifestyle. The main thing is always to recognize our true nature, our true face, our true heart, our true body. And I think that in most cases, rules and regulations, rigid rules, just get on the way of that. Years ago, Mahasiddha Babaji, he, he gave me a very simple advice. He told me to be yourself, find your own way. Be yourself. Find your own way. That is a very profound advice. He didn't tell me to, and I'm not telling you to, be somebody else or become somebody else. Or to follow some imposed rules and regulations. I'm not telling you any of that. Be yourself, find your own way through recognizing our basic state. Through recognizing this bedrock foundation. Completely pure, completely fresh. Always joyful positive, happy, happy, and full, complete. Chokchen is called the practice of great perfection or um, uh, Mahasandhi. Chokchen is Mahasandhi in Sanskrit, which means great perfection. It's a direct uh, definition of the Buddha that we all have within. It's great and it's perfect. 
it's great in the sense that it's not small, limited or contracted. Completely without that. We're sitting here, recognizing the basic peacefulness that is not, an, it's not, a, you know, if we did concentration practices, practices, shamatha practice, and we were perhaps following the breath for hours or days on a retreat, that would gives, give us one type of experience of calmness and one-pointed concentration. So if we did concentration practice, it would we would need to build it, we would need to construct it, accumulate it. But here we are not doing that. We are not practicing shamatha. We are practicing Ati Yoga, Chokchen. We are recognizing ourselves as Buddhas, as uh, fully and completely wakeful, grounded and peaceful beings. It's a very different kind of practice. If at any point you feel physical discomfort, numbness, pains, whatever, you can and should change posture, adjust posture, or you can also, you know, move <clears throat> whatever part of your body feels numb or tense, you can move, you know. The Buddha within doesn't disappear if you start moving. It doesn't go away. And this you come to understand perfectly when, when you advance in your bumi openings and the eleventh pops up, pops open. Then this, uh, you know, the recognition sustains itself, and you no longer need to seek, seek for it, look for it. And after that, it just keeps becoming fuller and fuller and fuller because of mind purification, boomy perfections. Like I said <clears throat> yesterday, if you feel sleepy and you can fall asleep without losing conscious um, recognition, that is perfectly fine. But if you feel drowsy and you start, we call it ice fishing in Finland, where you go on an ice and you start fishing with this, holding a small uh, how should I say, fishing rod and kind of jerking it. But uh, if you start doing the same, if you start nodding because of sleepiness, then wake yourself up. You can you know, stretch your body, shake your body vigorously, do Vajra bodies, Vajra breaths. You can stand up and shake, you can go and splash 
cold water on your face. So retreat when uh, you're receiving instructions. It's not the time to sleep or be drowsy. You need the instruction. It's useful. So we are sitting here <coughs> with all sentient beings. <coughs> all sentient beings. I plan to uh, teach some Tonglen, which is one type of bodhicitta practice. But you know, as you know, <coughs> in Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism, there is a you know, bodhicitta is uh, one of the main building blocks of Mahayana practice. <clears throat> and it means that we have a motivation to attain Buddhahood not only for our own sake. Let's think about this for a moment. How does it feel for you if you just think that I want to attain complete liberation, Buddhahood, just for my own sake. Taste that for a moment. So I'm not saying that um, I'm disregarding others, I'm just not paying attention to others. I'm just focused on my own enlightenment, in my own existential and spiritual well-being. Do you have a taste of that? <clears throat> and then we do it the proper way. <clears throat> so e express, let's express that I want to attain complete and full Buddhahood of emptiness body and light body for the sake of all sentient beings. For the sake of all sentient beings. for the sake of everybody. How does that feel compared to the former example? It opens up the subtle body <clears throat> in a completely different way. It is interesting, isn't it? So we can look at bodhicitta as motivation, as a compass, Compass of compassion. That's interesting. It's almost the same word. I never realized that before. Every day I learn something new. So it's kind of a compass. It's a way to, you know, have a direction. So we can look at it from this 
a relative perspective. But what is really interesting is that, <clears throat> you know, we have Bodhisattva vows. And I think a couple of you will take refuge, including Bodhisattva vows on this retreat. Uh, but um, Bodhisattva vows that we often chant in basic prayers, you know, they might seem um, kind of just something that you repeat or see in a bit, um, in a way that it's kind of something separate. It, it's something that you use or something that you apply. But Bodhisattva vows and Bodhicitta, it, it grows on us. It becomes part of us. It becomes us. And when we express bodhicitta, we simply have that direction. We align with the ideas and thoughts expressed in bodhicitta prayers. We become that bodhicitta, which means heart-mind of enlightenment. Bodhicitta is something that all Buddhas and Mahasiddhas express. This is not something that, you know, it can be used as a relative tool and motivation in practice. But it is really something that enlightened beings express care and concern of the existential spiritual well-being of all beings. Because it is dualistic ignorance, self-based ignorance, that is the cause of all dividing and separation and conflicts, wars, fights between beings. So bodhicitta is an actual way to grow out of self-based ignorance. It is not merely something on the side. It is the main course. And bodhicitta means chitta can be translated in different ways. Um, you know, in the West we speak of mind and heart as separate things, but in Asian language and culture, these are not two separate things. Mind feels emotions that we think that the heart does here in the West. So they don't have a separation between mind and heart. And that's why I like to translate chitta as heart-mind. Something that feels, thinks, perceives. And bodhi means awakening or enlightenment.
So here we are together sitting still. So we are kind of in a laboratory um, studying and learning about these things. But there is no reason why we couldn't recognize just like we are now, recognizing with our body, in our body, this basic state, full of peace, full of, uh, what is that word? Is it bristling? Bristling with joy? Something like that, like a sizzling with joy, it's not that word either, but something like it. Brimming with joy, that's a good one. So here we are sitting still. So it's kind of a uh, kind of like a laboratory situation, but there is no reason why we couldn't have the same recognition when active. Is there? Something that is really important to understand is that if you feel special, if uh, it feels like you um, become separate from your surroundings, if it feels like you kind of go into a bubble that is a different state from everyday life, then the recognition is incorrect. It's exactly the opposite. There is no bubble of samsaric mind action, although thoughts are not, this I was talking about Vipassana yesterday, so thoughts are not the enemy or they are not the problem because we practice Vipassana. But there is no mind uh, bubble, mind bubble of samsaric energy going around like stuff in a washing machine, nor there is a special spiritual meditative state. No trance, no heightened consciousness, exalted consciousness, heavenly states, nope. We, our butts never leave the sitting surface. Our feet don't begin to float above the ground. We stay here, but there's a shift in the mind. Samsaric beings have samsaric mind, so what we are doing here is that we are turning attention from mind of movements to mind that is still. Recognizing it and staying in that recognition. And my question was that, is there a reason why this basic peacefulness, basic state couldn't be recognized when we are, we go about our daily activities? If we are in a samsaric mind and then we are <clears throat> trying to work, trying to do house chores, you know how it is. It, it's all fragmented and distorted. It's all colored. Rather than being present and doing those things that we have to do, you know, it's constant movement and associations to this and that and that. And then we get pissed off about something because we remember something and, oh, I was supposed to do that. and. You know, it's, it's like that, isn't it? So we are not really present 
with people in situations. On the other hand, if we are still at work <coughs> or at home and if it was some heavenly or exalted state that we were cultivating here, there would be an instant kind of clash, instant disharmony. Because you can't be in a heavenly meditative state or a trance state and talk to your friend or be with your child or do your work. So that doesn't work either. And this is the genius of Buddha Dharma. Basic wakefulness, Buddha nature is not separated from anything. And neither it is a state that we go to and go out from. It is not a state of meditative absorption or trance. It is popping out of all bubbles and states. And actually also <clears throat> seeing through of all states. That's why it's called non-meditation. Not meditating. If by meditation is meant uh, some kind of concentration activity or being mindful of something or going into a special state. So we recognize this basic state, ourselves as Buddhas, with our physical muscles, with our hearts, with our bodies, in the backbone, in genitalia, in our heads, in our whole body. Feel how this, how this experience feels like. How does it taste? How does it smell? What does it sound like? How does it feel like? How is this state in comparison to me, myself? What is the relation of this state and myself? Is there distance? between me and this state. If there is distance, how much? How close the two are to each other? Or does the whole question about distance sound silly? If there is distance between this and that, it uh, implies duality, two, two-ness, two things. On the other hand, if you think that, or if you perceive, if you feel that myself and this Buddha nature are the same thing, It's not oneness of me and Buddha nature having become one, 
it's not that either. But that I am the Buddha, like we chant in Absolute Refuge. This is who I am. This is not what I merely experience. This is not what I perceive to be outside myself. And this is why we have absolute refuge and absolute, bod absolute bodhicitta together with relative versions. So that we don't, we have both perspectives. So when you recognize, when you, even if for a short moment, when you recognize that, oh heck, it's, you know, I, this Buddha nature is actually who I am. That's when you get, even if it's a short moment, that's when you get what is recited in Absolute Refuge, when saying, I am the Buddha. And little by little, as the Bhumi's uh, layers in the energetic body get purified, you see, you perceive it more and more. More and more and more until the whole mind is purified. Until the whole mind with all selfing in it, day or night, is completely gone. When all mind modifications created and caused by the sense of self have ceased for good. Bumi openings and Bumi perfections are small moments of ceasing. Ceasing or cessation C-E-S-S-A-T-I-O-N, cessation, that's a special thing in yoga. It means that the self-based mind ceases for a moment, ceases to be for a moment. And that's when the Buddha within is uh, recognized without any interference of the self-based mind. Cessation. Nirodha. Is the Sanskrit word. Nirodha. So we need many moments of cessation, many moments of nirodha, to, to one, uh, so that at one point we can reach a state of nirvana. Nirvana means uh, blown out, like when we have a candle and it's lit and we blow it and it goes out. That's what nirvana means. And there are different types of nirvanas, but that's a, a bit technical matter that I won't go into now. I already defined what we are doing here and how we are meditating, that we are not going into bubbles, also not going into the bubble of liberation.
uh, stay in this recognition. Uh, let's lie down for 10-15 minutes. I'll let you know when to get up.